on this rundown farm. The Canadian police discovered an unimaginable horror. This is the largest serial killing investigation in North America. A slaughterhouse for human beings. There was DNA all over the farm, body parts in the form of bones and teeth and partial jaw bones. For more than a decade, a predator had hunted women in Vancouver. The killing, the dismembering, it was just a process he really enjoyed. The skulls were bisected with a reciprocating saw, which he used in his slaughterhouse on the pigs. At the time of his capture, the number of dead and missing women was staggering. He was going for an even 50 as far as the number of victims were concerned. His shocking crimes earned him the name The Butcher. Robert Willie Picton, Vancouver's most prolific serial killer. February 1999, Willie Picton was on the prowl. He headed to Vancouver's downtown east side, looking for a prostitute or a drug addict, any woman desperate for money. He spotted a young cocaine addict and offered to buy her drugs. Once ensnared, he took her back to his trailer. Once dead, Picton knew how to make his victim disappear. Willie was suspected of literally butchering the women like the animals or the pigs that he butchered. Picton's gruesome methods made his crimes almost undetectable. To stop him, the police had to conduct the most complex investigation in Canadian history. Robert William Picton was born on the 24th of October, 1949. His parents, Leonard and Louise Picton, ran a pig farm in Port Coquitlam, 15 miles east of Vancouver. On the farm, the family raised, slaughtered and butchered livestock. The life on their farm was very primitive. The animals were always allowed to run in and out of the Picton house. Willie's older sister, Linda, lived with relatives in Vancouver because his father believed that a pig farm was no place for a girl to grow up. Willie and his younger brother David stayed behind to work. And their demanding mother made sure that the boys stayed on task. She really was a tyrant. She ran the roost. The kids worked very, very hard. And she had this distinctive voice. She'd shout at the kids and say, you kids get over here right now, and she'd screech at them. For Louise Picton, pigs came first, and cleanliness wasn't a concern. The Picton children were famous for stinking of manure and of pigs and unwashed clothing and unwashed bodies. When they got on the school bus in the morning, children didn't want to sit near them, and they called them stinky piggy. Willie struggled at school. His teachers labelled him slow, and he was given special lessons. He and his brother tried to escape school in any way possible. They would come back home and sneak into the house and hide under their beds. And they would stay there all day until school was out, so that their parents wouldn't know that they had skipped. Friendless, the young Willie focused on farm work, especially caring for the family's livestock. When he was 11 years old, Willie used his savings to buy a calf at auction. The animal became his pet and only friend. He just really loved the calf. Every day he would come home and nurture it, take care of it, feed it. One day he came home and the, the calf was missing. Willie went to his mother and she was very brisk with him and said to go, go down to the barn. He went down to the barn and found that the calf had been slaughtered. He was hysterical. That numbed out any feelings he ever had for human connection and for understanding that, that he could love or to connect to someone. I think that was severed at that point. 
Willie continued to struggle in school, and in 1963, the 14-year-old dropped out. He found work as a butcher's apprentice, where he discovered a talent for dissecting animals. He knew how to saw them, where to saw them, where to make the incisions in the body parts, how to skin them. In short, he knew what he was doing. For the next four years, Willie kept up his chores and his apprenticeship. It was a relatively happy time for the 18-year-old. But life on the Picton farm was rarely happy or normal for long. On the 16th of October, 1967, Willie was taught a shocking lesson. Dave Picton had just got his driver's license. He was 16. And he took the family truck out for a bit of a joyride down the road. The inexperienced driver accidentally hit a young boy walking along a country road. David raced home and told his mother what had happened. As Willie later told friends, his mother knew just what to do. She told him to take the truck right away to the garage that looked after their vehicles and get it fixed, and I'll take care of the kid. Louise found the boy lying in the road. He was badly injured, but still alive. The evidence suggests that she rolled his body into a watery ditch where he drowned. Although suspicious of the circumstances, the police ruled the death an accident. None of the Pictons were charged with a crime. It was a family where if you could get away with something, you got away with it. Picton's mother was extremely antisocial, and I think it was those antisocial traits that um, Louise had that really affected Willie and really shaped his feelings about what he could get away with. In 1970, just after his 21st birthday, Willie inexplicably left his apprenticeship. He went to work full time on his parents' farm. There was really no one else but Willie to do the, the farm work. I think in the back of his mind, he thought, if I go out in the world, you know, there's a possibility I'm going to fail. The feeling of being connected, maybe almost too dependent on his mother, I think that pulled him back towards the farm and gave him a feeling like it was, it was a safer place to be. Willie continued to feed the pigs and shovel manure. And he added a few new jobs to his list. He'd go to auction and buy pigs, then bring them back to the farm and slaughter them. Willie's work often took him to West Coast Reduction, an animal waste disposal facility near downtown Vancouver. Willie was known to drop off barrels of materials at the rendering plant, uh, which would take the materials and turn them into other products. After trips to the plant, Willie often visited a seedy neighborhood known as Low Track in Vancouver's downtown east side. The area attracted prostitutes and drug addicts. The downtown east side is probably the biggest concentration of human misery that exists in the developed world. I mean, there's nothing like it anywhere else in terms of the numbers of people that are down and out and never coming back. People are forced to support themselves through selling drugs, selling their bodies, stealing. At street corners and dingy bars, Willie could pay for companionship, affection, and sex, things he couldn't get anywhere else. He spent large amounts of money on the girl, whatever she wanted for, like, endless amounts. So when they returned, they would brag about him to the, her, their friends, that this guy is, like, a really good guy to go be with. Amid the sordid lives of Lotrak's population, Willie found his niche. He began frequenting the Astoria Hotel, a pub on East Hastings Street. Here, men talked to him as equals, and women offered him sexual favors. He had grown up as a very powerless person, and to have people that he could do favors for, help out, do anything, gave him a position, gave him a feeling that he had some sort of power. Power that he enjoyed. But gradually, Willie's need for power grew. He picked up prostitutes with increasing regularity. Outwardly, 
he seemed friendly, even caring. But once a girl got into his car, he could turn violent. Guys like Willie, they need more and more stimulation because they feel restless, they feel bored, and I think the only way to get that is to do to, to kind of up the ante and to do something more. Willie Picton's harsh childhood and dark desires were transforming him into a monster. And the women of Vancouver's low track would prove to be easy prey. He just did what he knew, and that was butcher and dispose of things. And you've got this recipe for murder that just doesn't end. In 1975, 25-year-old Willie Picton spent his days butchering pigs and his nights trawling for prostitutes in Vancouver's seedy downtown east side. Willie had two personalities, you know. He would be the kind of aw shucks, simple farm boy out in the country. In town, he was the big spender, the boss of the Astoria, handing out the money, handing out the drugs. He'd settled into a predictable, if not disturbing, routine. But in 1978, Picton's life changed abruptly. His parents' health had been failing, and in January of that year, his father died. Soon after, his mother became terminally ill with cancer. As Willie took care of her, he saw this once all-powerful woman become sickly and frail. changed her diapers, he looked after her, he nursed her. And he also found that very traumatic. The most basic primitive thing in the world is a relationship a child has with its mother. It's the first relationship, and it's one that is very hard to break. To have to care for her was probably one of the hardest things he had to do. In April, Willie's mother died, leaving the farm and slaughterhouse to her three children. The siblings split the modest inheritance, but Willie's brother and sister wanted nothing to do with the family business. They left the farm work to Willie. After all, butchering pigs was what he knew best. Willie's not the brightest guy in the world. He was dirty and he lived like a pig and his life revolved around pigs. I really don't think he enjoyed life on the farm, but he knew it was his responsibility, that it was something he had to do. There was a fear that he wouldn't succeed out in the bigger world. And there also might have been a feeling on his part that they did have this pig farm. It could be worth something someday, and it might be worth sticking around. Willie's brother Dave took over the main house, and Willie moved into a trailer on an isolated part of the property. He was still stuck on the farm, but for the first time in his life, Picton could do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. He frequently entertained female guests. He'd bring women out to stay for a while, and he would teach them butchering skills, and they would go to movies, and they would go shopping. It was sort of this bucolic, nice life with one of these women after another. These friends of Willie's didn't mind his poor hygiene. Willie was such a distasteful character that he had to troll pretty low to get friends. Most of his friends and associates were people that wanted things from him. Picton would often pay these women with money and drugs to clean his trailer or help around the farm. But they never had sex with Willie, and he wanted it badly. One evening in 1980, Picton was cruising the streets of Eastside. He spotted a young girl on Hastings Street. According to the girl, Willie picked her up in his truck, and, as she later told a journalist, he quickly turned violent. She was a 14-year-old that he picked up in his car in downtown Vancouver and attacked her with a knife. And he raped her and threw her out into a parking lot. He really saw the prostitutes as no better than the pigs. Maybe they were sort of low lives to him, people that you could do things to. Him getting away with it just sort of furthered the thrill. 
despite this seemingly newfound lust for violence, this alleged attack seemed to satiate Willie's desires. For over a decade, he resumed his routine of days on the farm and nights on the town. Then, in 1994, the Pictons sold the north end of the farm. The sale netted them almost $2 million. Flush with cash, Willie and his brother started a social events business in 1996. Piggy's Palace Good Time Society was an excuse for the brothers to throw wild parties. There would be literally hundreds of people, sometimes as many as 1,800 people had showed up. Willie often took prostitutes from low track to palace parties. Afterwards, they'd go to his trailer. They engaged in uh, uh, kinky sex involving bondage. For the first time in his life, Willie was in control. His recent wealth gave him power over people especially the wretched souls of Vancouver's low track. He exploited the vulnerable drug-addicted prostitutes in order to satisfy his disturbing sexual fantasies. He uh, was a pig farmer who obviously had a kind of taste for activities that most of us would consider not pleasant. And when he didn't get what he wanted, he could turn violent quickly. In March 1997, a prostitute called Wendy Eistetter went home with Picton. During sex, Willie tried to handcuff her, but she broke free. Picton grew enraged. He said that he, was, he had a knife and he was coming at her. Wendy managed to grab a knife from the kitchen. For every stab, he stabbed her and she stabbed him back. Barely clothed and badly wounded, Wendy fled the farm. An elderly couple driving past picked her up and took her to a nearby hospital. She's got scars everywhere, all over the place. It was, it was horrible. Like huge scars, like really, like gashed down in there and there. The police charged Picton with assault, but Wendy was too terrified to testify. She never showed up for the trial. The case against Picton was dismissed. He went back to his farm, back to his pigs, and back to his butcher knives. In August 1997, Picton returned to the CD low track. He approached a 24-year-old woman called Marnie Frey. Marnie was a heroin addict. Willie offered to buy her drugs in exchange for sex. He took her back to his trailer. After sex, he turned violent. Marnie was never seen again. He probably took her body apart and buried it in pieces on the farm, some of it anyway. What was left, he may have disposed of at West Coast Reduction, the animal waste disposal plant that Willie frequented. The murder of Marnie Frey marked the start of a violent new chapter in Picton's life. Along with a compelling desire to sexually dominate women, he now had a taste for murder. Between 1995 and 1997, 21 women vanished from Vancouver's sleazy downtown Eastside neighborhood. He loved every bit of it. The pickup, the courtship on the street corner downtown, how much he'd pay, the killing, the dismembering. I think it was just a process he really enjoyed. No one suspected that Willie Picton was luring women to his pig farm and slaughtering them. 
serial killers generally need a bigger and bigger thrill, and so they escalate their violence. When you see that with Willie, you see that he went from going to have sex with prostitutes to bringing them to his home, to raping someone, to uh, killing. In 1998, nine more women vanished. The police did not investigate, and they discounted the possibility of foul play. There were family members and friends and associates of the women that were, were missing that were filing police reports and being told, um, you know, these, these women just get on the, get on the Greyhound and uh, they go somewhere else. Police don't like to investigate any case where there isn't a body. So they said, oh, she's just visiting her family in Florida or whatever. They didn't want to take these cases seriously. But the prostitutes and drug addicts on Vancouver's Skid Row knew that they were being targeted. There wasn't no notice, like, we weren't informed or anything about the beware there's a monster on the street. It's just girls that were not on the car anymore. Elaine Allen ran a shelter that provided food and social services to women who worked the streets. It was horrifying watching women going missing. We were so aware of it. I think we all felt so powerless to do anything about it. Allen reported several disappearances but the police didn't follow them up. We were just constantly rebuffed and told that, you know, well, this, this woman typically takes off and she'll take off with a, with a John and, you know, she's fine. I'm sure she's just fine. The Vancouver police wouldn't even say serial and killer in the same sentence. They would say, well, what do you expect? These women will get in a car with a stranger. So who knows where they are? Like, you know, sort of a shrugging of the shoulders kind of attitude. Women from Low Track continued to go with Willie Picton, partly because of the money he gave them and partly because he had developed a reputation for being a nice guy. He even maintained friendships with a few women. I don't think it's surprising that a serial killer has another life. It's not a simple direction that every woman that they encounter they must kill. It's, a, a, it's more complicated than that. One of Willie's friends was a crack addict called Lynn Ellingson. For several months in 1999, she lived on his farm. After getting high in Willie's trailer one night, Lynn fell asleep. Something had awakened her that night, and she looked out and saw light coming from the slaughterhouse. Curious, she went outside to take a peek in, see what was going on. Dangling in front of her were a woman's purple painted toenails. It was Georgina Papin, Picton's latest victim. Terrified, Lynn fled the farm. Willie did not go after her. Well, Willie was a bit of a conundrum. Perhaps he didn't kill Lynn Ellingson because she was a friend. He'd gotten to know her. Most serial killers kill people that they don't know. Ellingson never went to the police, and Willie continued to butcher. The pig farmer millionaire was on his way to becoming Canada's most prolific serial killer. By February 1999, pig farmer Robert Willie Picton had murdered at least two women. But more than 30 women were missing from the streets of Vancouver. As the police continued to discount the disappearances, Picton prepared to claim another victim. Her name was Brenda Wolfe. She was a drug addict who had come to Willie's pig farm hoping to score some drugs. She never left. He typically bound his victims or handcuffed them and strangled some victims either with wire or with belt. As Willie later claimed, he carried his victims' lifeless bodies to the slaughterhouse. With the precision of an experienced butcher, he cut them up. He just did what he knew, and that was butcher and dispose of things. He probably never gave it any thought. For most of his victims, Picton would load their remains into barrels and dump them at West Coast Reduction. 
Brenda was the 53rd Vancouver woman to vanish without a trace. The missing women were all prostitutes or drug addicts from the city's skid row. Women were very scared. They saw their friends were going missing. They, they knew that. I heard women say, I'm going to be the next one. If you don't see me tomorrow, you know, I'm going out tonight. Come looking for me. As women became increasingly nervous, Willie began having trouble convincing them to come to his farm. Willie has diminished capacities. He's a bit of a dim bulb, but he was shifty and clever in, in a kind of animal way. The pig farmer had a few female friends, and he found ways to use them to lure victims. One of his friends was Dinah Taylor. Willie sent Taylor to women's shelters in search of prostitutes and drug addicts. Dinah Taylor would go in there and they'd say, let's go party with Uncle Willie. He's got drugs, he's got booze, he's got money. I do remember seeing her in the center a few times in the evenings. She would pop in and sometimes pop out with the, with the woman with her. And once he had them at his farm, the women were easy prey. It's sort of a psychological thrill to go from being the rejected to being the one that sits back and has women being brought to him, and not only being brought to him, but being brought to him to prepare for slaughter. He would usually accuse them of stealing something from him, stealing money from his wallet, something like that, and use that as an excuse to work up a rage against them, and then he'd attack them. By January 2001, the number of missing women had reached 62. The authorities could no longer ignore the problem. That April, the Vancouver Police Department and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police launched the Missing Women's Task Force. Reward posters promised $100,000 for information leading to an arrest. Over 12,000 tip-offs flooded the hotline. Several callers mentioned a pig farmer east of Vancouver. Willie's name was eventually added to a list of suspects. He had a prior arrest for assault, but no convictions. The police didn't probe any further. They didn't really know how to look for a serial killer. They didn't have the manpower. They had terrible records. They didn't have a DNA bank to check the identity of these women. The families of the missing women were desperate for answers. They urged the police to investigate. It didn't matter how many times you phoned them and explained to them that we think that she could be on this farm or somewhere out in Port Coquitlam. They didn't seem to care. I don't know why they didn't put more importance on him. Uh, they were tracking a whole lot of different people, and he probably just fell through the cracks. Willie continued his killing spree during the course of 2001. In June, he murdered Andrea Josbury. And in August, Serena Abbotsway became his next conquest. But unlike his other victims, Picton didn't immediately dispose of their bodies. Instead, he placed their heads, hands and feet inside plastic buckets and stored them in a meat freezer. I think he got sloppy. I think he got careless. Here's a man who may not have really understood the implications of what could happen to him. I think he thought he was sort of invulnerable. Again, going back to his mother, he, his mother got away with murder, and I think he felt sort of invincible. In November 2001, Willie stopped on the corner of Maine and Hastings to talk to 26-year-old Mona Wilson. At his promise of free dope and booze, she jumped into his car. Instead of taking Mona to his trailer, Picton led her to a camper van behind a barn. After sex, he savagely beat her. Perhaps this particular woman tried to fight back or did something that was outside the script that, that Willie had in his mind and that somehow it must have set off whatever psychological rage that he had. Picton then shot her with a 22 caliber revolver. Her blood spattered the walls and soaked into the mattress. 
it just could have been that as time went on, he was escalating his violence because he had more and more of a need just to act it out um, in ways that were more violent. By the end of 2001, 64 women from Vancouver's low track were on the list of missing women. But the police were no closer to breaking the case. Finally, on the 1st of February 2002, investigators got an unexpected lead. A truck driver who occasionally worked at the Picton farm told an officer that he'd once seen illegal weapons in Willie's trailer. Curious to learn more about a potential murder suspect, the police obtained a search warrant. They had to move very, very carefully. They didn't want to lose this one. Four days later, the Vancouver police closed in on the Picton property. Their gruesome discoveries would trigger the largest forensic investigation in Canadian history. The 5th of February 2002. Drug addicts and prostitutes were mysteriously disappearing from Vancouver's downtown east side. What the police didn't know was that one man had murdered at least six of these women and sadistically butchered their corpses. But a confidential tip-off was about to lead to an unexpected break in the case. Armed with a search warrant, the police were preparing to raid Robert Willie Picton's pig farm. Their search was for illegal weapons, but they soon found much more than that. One of the investigators came across an inhaler that had one of the missing women's name on it. It was prescribed to Serena Abbott's way. And at that point, the Joint Task Force decided to halt the firearms investigation and obtain new search warrants. Willie Picton spent the night behind bars. The police alerted the media to the break in the case. By dawn, reporters and camera crews from across the country had surrounded the farm. Everyone just stood there with their mouths open. The imaginations went wild. It was like everyone's worst nightmare come true. Inside the property, investigators uncovered a grisly scene. Proof of Mona Wilson's murder. Her blood was found soaked into a mattress. It was found on the floor. It was found on cupboards. It was found on the walls. All the way to the, the kitchen. In a rubbish bin outside the camper van was all that remained of the missing woman. You could see her brain, you could see her hair, you could see the just the bisected human head and floating in this pinkish soup. In an interrogation room, task force officers grilled Picton for hours. But he was surprisingly calm and he denied everything. There was a part of him that didn't care the same way his mother didn't care that he had feelings. He put his legs up over the edge of the chair and he was having a good time. And he was really enjoying himself. After 11 hours of intense questioning, the investigators changed tactics. They decided to put an undercover police officer in the cell with Willie to see if he said anything. Willie knew he was under surveillance, but that didn't stop him from bragging to his cellmate. At one point, Willie told the undercover cop that he was going for an even 50, which in Willie's mind meant that he had killed 49 women. Picton also implied that he'd used a disposal plant to get rid of the bodies. He mentioned to the undercover policeman that um, he got sloppy in the end. He finally had somebody that he could talk to about what was really happening. One of the biggest parts for serial killers is to get to brag about how many people they've killed. On the 22nd of February, the police charged Picton with the murders of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson. Meanwhile, a small army of police and forensic specialists were converging on the farm to search for the remains of the other victims. The police investigators made a grid of the entire property and they were searching it grid box by grid box. The forensic investigation revealed a terrifying record of murder and depravity. There were some freezers in there. One of the freezers contained two buckets with each containing the head and hands of, and feet of Serena Abbott's way and Andrea Josbury. They took literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of DNA samples. 
It was just a mind-boggling police operation. Just a forensic search that probably is unraveled almost anywhere. By April 2002, the police had enough evidence to charge Picton with five more counts of murder. Stories about Picton's butchery made headlines across Canada and the United States. A few times I had phone calls from journalists asking me if I knew a particular woman, and I'd say, yeah, sure, I know her. Why? And they'd say, well, her remains were just found on Robert Picton's farm. I had to process the fact that they were talking about someone who I had assumed was alive. Even with Picton behind bars, details about the murder spread terror throughout the city. On the 11th of March 2004, Canadian health officials issued a shocking statement. Cross-contamination could mean that, that human remains did get into or contaminate some of the pork meat that was produced. We've been given a lot of pig meat from that pig farm. The night that this all broke on the news, we phoned Lynn, and the first thing that my daughter had said to her aunt was I was really sorry with Auntie Lynn, because it's possible we could have eaten Marnie. No one brought meat forward, but for many, Picton's trial could not start soon enough. The forensic investigation of the evidence gathered at Willie Picton's farm lasted 22 months. By the end of 2005, the police had catalogued enough evidence to charge Picton with a total of 27 murders. But their case wasn't as strong as they'd hoped. January 2006, the trial of Canada's worst serial killer was about to begin. Throngs of spectators, including dozens of victims' family members, filled a Vancouver courtroom. They came to see a killer brought to justice. Pig farmer Robert Willie Picton was charged with killing and dismembering 27 women. But the authorities believed that the number of victims could be as high as 49. Chilling details about his crimes gripped people in Canada and the US. What makes Picton front page news is this almost perverse combination, pig farming and you know, serial sexual predator. It became a sort of fascinatingly lurid case. Pre-trial hearings took almost a year. Justice James Williams dismissed one murder charge for lack of evidence. He also divided the cases into two trials. The cases were just so complex and so long, the judge ordered a severance so that the case would become manageable. Picton would first stand trial for six counts of murder. And to ensure a fair trial, the judge issued a strict ban, limiting what details journalists could share about the proceedings. The first trial began on the 2nd of January 2007. Inside the new Westminster Supreme Court, family members came face to face with the man that many called the butcher. He's always got a smirk on his face. He just gives me the creeps when I'm in the courtroom. He just gives me the creeps. Willie Picton pleaded not guilty to murdering Marnie Frey, Serena Abbotsway, Georgina Papin, Andrea Josbury, Brenda Wolfe, and Mona Wilson. The prosecution led the jury through a staggering array of evidence, including gruesome crime scene photographs, blood spatter analysis, forensic and DNA evidence. There was all kinds of evidence presented, like woman's jacket and lipstick and um, night vision, ogles, manacles, just really ugly, terrifying stuff. Among the witnesses who testified against Willie, Andrew Bellwood was a man who had lived at the Picton farm for several weeks in 1999. He testified that Willie had play-acted the murder of prostitutes on his bed, uh, kneeling down and pretending that he was strangling a prostitute with a belt or a piece of wire. The defense attacked Bellwood's credibility, citing his criminal record and former drug use. But Bellwood's story still chilled the courtroom. 
His descriptions were very, very detailed. Equally compelling was the testimony of Willie's one-time friend, Lynn Ellingson. She was the only person that was going to testify that she'd seen Willie Picton with a dead woman. But Picton's defense team shredded Ellingson's testimony. They exposed inconsistencies in her story and reminded the jurors that she'd been using drugs the night of the alleged murder. The defense worked very hard to undermine her credibility with a great deal of success. As the trial continued, the defense team portrayed Willie as a simpleton who wasn't capable of committing these elaborate murders on his own. In some sense, he was almost a primitive animal. People talk about how smart he is, but wolves and animals kill all the time. And Willie was probably one step removed from them. Picton's lawyers suggested that friends like Ellingson or Dinah Taylor could have been responsible. Final arguments concluded on the 26th of November, 2007. The jury deliberated for two weeks. On the 8th of December, the victim's families and journalists gathered to hear the jury's verdict. Suddenly we realized that some of the jurors were in tears. And that told me right away that there was going to be a problem with this verdict. And from the family's point of view, there was. The jury found Picton not guilty on all counts of first-degree murder. The families that were in the courtroom started to scream. But Picton did not escape justice. The jury did find him guilty on six counts of second-degree murder. Judge Williams gave him the maximum sentence, 25 years in prison. it's essentially about premeditation. And so you wonder how someone who killed six women didn't premeditate that, that it wasn't planned and orchestrated. The jury just couldn't reconcile in their mind whether or not he acted alone. A date for the second trial has not been set. Friends and family members of Picton's other 20 alleged victims are still waiting for their day in court. To think that we still have 20 charges that have never been tried against Robert Picton feels like unfinished business to me. Investigators may never know exactly how many women were murdered on the Picton farm. And another haunting question. What turned a lonely boy on a Canadian pig farm into possibly the country's most prolific serial killer? is that combination of nature and nurture, of learning, of psychology, and also maybe genetics. Maybe he had a predisposition to being this way, but he also learned that life didn't really have much meaning. I know a lot of women on the downtown east side who uh, would say, just let him walk, just let him be free for five minutes and we'll deal with him. On this rundown farm, the Canadian police discovered an unimaginable horror. This is the largest serial killing investigation in North America. A slaughterhouse for human beings. There was DNA all over the farm, body parts in the form of bones and teeth and partial jaw bones. For more than a decade, a predator had hunted women in Vancouver. The killing, the dismembering. It was just a process he really enjoyed. The skulls were bisected with the reciprocating saw, which he used in his slaughterhouse on the pigs. At the time of his capture, the number of dead and missing women was staggering. He was going for an even 50 as far as the number of victims were concerned. His shocking crimes earned him the name The Butcher. Robert Willie Picton. Vancouver's most prolific serial killer. February 1999, Willie Picton was on the prowl. He headed to Vancouver's downtown east side, looking for a prostitute or a drug addict, any woman desperate for money. He spotted a young cocaine addict and offered to buy her drugs. Once ensnared, he took her back to his trailer. Ah! 
once dead, Picton knew how to make his victim disappear. Willie was suspected of literally butchering the women like the animals or the pigs that he butchered. Picton's gruesome methods made his crimes almost undetectable. To stop him, the police had to conduct the most complex investigation in Canadian history. On the prowl. He headed to Vancouver's downtown east side, looking for a prostitute or a drug addict. Any woman desperate for money. He spotted a young cocaine addict and offered to buy her drugs. Once ensnared, he took her back to his trailer. Once dead, Picton knew how to make his victim disappear. Willie was suspected of literally butchering the women like the animals or the pigs that he butchered. Picton's gruesome methods made his crimes almost undetectable. To stop him, the police had to conduct the most complex investigation in Canadian history. Robert William Picton was born on the 24th of October 1949. His parents, Leonard and Louise Picton, ran a pig farm in Port Coquitlam, 15 miles east of Vancouver. On the farm, the family raised, slaughtered, and butchered livestock. The life on their farm was very primitive. The animals were always allowed to run in and out of the Picton house. Willie's older sister, Linda, lived with relatives in Vancouver because his father believed that a pig farm was no place for a girl to grow up. Willie and his younger brother, David, stayed behind to work. And their demanding mother, made sure that the boys stayed on task. She really was a tyrant. She ran the roost. The kids worked very, very hard. And she had this distinctive voice. She'd shout at the kids and say, you kids get out of here right now. And she'd screech at them. For Louise Picton, pigs came first and cleanliness wasn't a concern. The Picton children were famous for stinking of manure and of pigs and unwashed clothing and unwashed bodies. When they got on the school bus in the morning, children didn't want to sit near them and they called them Stinky Piggy. Willie struggled at school. His teachers labeled him slow and he was given special lessons. He and his brother tried to escape school in any way possible. They would come back home and sneak into the house and hide under their beds. And they would stay there all day until school was out, so that their parents wouldn't know that they had skipped. Friendless, the young Willie focused on farm work, especially caring for the family's livestock. When he was 11 years old, Willie used his savings to buy a calf at auction. The animal became his pet and only friend. He just really loved the calf. Every day he would come home and nurture it, take care of it, feed it. One day he came home and the, the calf was missing. Willie went to his mother and she was very brisk with him and said to go, go down to the barn. He went down to the barn and found that the calf had been slaughtered. He was hysterical. That numbed out any feelings he ever had for human connection and for understanding that, that he could love or to connect to someone. I think that was severed at that point. Willie continued to struggle in school, and in 1963, the 14-year-old dropped out. He found work as a butcher's apprentice, where he discovered a talent for dissecting animals. He knew how to saw them, where to saw them, where to make the incisions in the body parts, how to skin them. In short, he knew what he was doing. For the next four years, Willie kept up his chores and his apprenticeship. It was a relatively happy time for the 18-year-old. But life on the Picton farm was rarely happy or normal for long. 
On the 16th of October, 1967, Willie was taught a shocking lesson. Dave Picton had just got his driver's license. He was 16, and he took the family truck out for a bit of a joyride down the road. The inexperienced driver accidentally hit a young boy walking along a country road. David raced home and told his mother what had happened. As Willie later told friends, his mother knew just what to do. She told him to take the truck right away to the garage that looked after their vehicles and get it fixed, and I'll take care of the kid. Louise found the boy lying in the road. He was badly injured, but still alive. The evidence suggests that she rolled his body into a watery ditch where he drowned. On this rundown farm, the Canadian police discovered an unimaginable horror. This is the largest serial killing investigation in North America. A slaughterhouse for human beings. There was DNA all over the farm, body parts in the form of bones and teeth and partial jaw bones. For more than a decade, a predator had hunted women in Vancouver. The killing, the dismembering, it was just a process he really enjoyed. The skulls were bisected with the reciprocating saw, which he used in his slaughterhouse on the pigs. At the time of his capture, the number of dead and missing women was staggering. He was going for an even 50 as far as the number of victims were concerned. His shocking crimes earned him the name The Butcher. Robert Willie Picton, Vancouver's most prolific serial killer. February 1999. Willie Picton.